if you have one of these, smoke them or turn them off, please. Good afternoon. I am Walt Lindy, uh, the current president of the uh, Senior Academy and a retired staff member. It is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of IUPY Senior Academy to the 2014 last lecture presentation. The Senior Academy is an organization of retired faculty and staff, members who are actively involved in the universities and participates in its missions of healthcare, education, and research. Plus, we also sponsor three student scholarships for study here at the university. This is sort of my last lecture, too. That is Master of Ceremonies, because I'm finishing my term as president. And I want to, with the, keeping with the philosophy, I want to give you some last words of, of wisdom. Okay. <laughs> If you want to stay in touch with the uh, campus, with the university, after you retire, and I see a lot of white hair and some white gray beards out there, join the Senior Academy. It's a wonderful organization. It stays, helps you stay in touch with the university, and it accomplishes a lot to help the, <coughs> the university meet its missions. So please think of us if you retire. At this point, and as co-sponsor of the IUP administration and the IU Foundation, I welcome you to this year's last lecture presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nassar Padar, Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Academic Officer of IUPUI, who will join me in welcoming you and offer his remarks. Dr. Padar. Thank you, Walt. And good afternoon. And good afternoon. good afternoon. All right, that's better. What a beautiful sight. I look around, I see so many people that I had the pleasure of working with so many years at IUPUI. You are the reason that IUPUI is as successful as it is. Uh, and I put down here, I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm an engineer. I want to make sure I'm accurate in some of the things I want to give you here. But we've had at IUPUI 19 years of growth in student credit hours. Show me a university that has had that many years of growth. None. We have truly become the university of choice for many communities in our region. That's terrific. We serve, 90% of our students are Hoosiers, so we do serve the state, but we also have students from all states and 147 countries. Just to put that, yeah. To put that in perspective, in Sochi, there were 89 countries that participated in that. So we, we serve more countries than we do there. You know, we have 1,686, 80, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 1,969 beds on campus. When we were formed, put together in 69, we had about 700 beds because many of our parts existed for a number of years. So it's taken about 100 years to go from zero bed to 1,969, I am confident in the next five years we will double that number. We are working on that. We are pushing for that. We do have responsibilities for those who want to live on campus and be successful. So we are working very hard on that one as well. 9,000. I feel like I'm, the, the cousins have come to, to, to our home and I'm giving all the gossips about the place. 9,000 of 22,000 undergraduate students at IUPUI are engaged in some type of experiential learning in the community. Service learning, internship, working with different places, that is community engagement. That is what we contribute to this, to this area. And there is more research within one mile of where you're sitting than any spot in the state of Indiana. And that deserves Now, as impressive our past has been because of your good work, our future is even brighter. 
but we need to do more. So that's why we started on a strategic planning process a year and a half ago. I want to thank all the hundreds of faculty staff that participated in that, especially the senior academy who contributed to that. So among the things that we have identified and working on it, there are, it's on the website you could take a look at, but student success is our number one there. We are going to develop a division for undergraduate education on the campus. We are going to convert our enrollment services to enrollment management driven by data, predictive modeling, so that we can bring students that can be successful here and we can uh, attend to them. PhDs at IUPI, we are working very hard on that one. We will increase the number of PhDs on this side. We are working with our colleagues at Purdue University to see how, what we could do with the Purdue PhD programs here. We are going after uh, some degree programs that we already have and produce informatics PhDs, another one that we are going to commission for our education to get the authority for this place. We are working very hard in contributing not just undergraduate masters but PhD as well in this area. We have a work on research plan. We are trying to bring all of our community engagement offices together under one umbrella, one website, one phone number, so that community knows where to contact, how we can be engaged, and how they could con connect with us. So for all of this, I thank you. <coughs> you have done a great job. Among us is David Stokum, who has done a marvelous job. I've been, uh, uh, had the pleasure of working with him for a number of years and had discussions with it. One thing that I could say about David, and, and the pleasure of introducing David is going to go to Kim, uh, Dr. Kim Wynn, but I want to say uh, one thing is truly remarkable about David Stokum. Many people, when they cross the, from the dark side administration to the light side, <laughs> as he did when he stepped down from the dean's position, they go to beaches and, and mountains and they spend their after time looking at other things. But he looked at science. He wrote papers. He submitted grants. He did receive grants. He wrote a book that is being used today in many universities, all after stepping down from the administration. So for that, we thank him. We thank him for, for coming here and talking to us today. Speaking about thank, I want to thank all of the people that have had a uh, hand in making today possible, the senior academy staff, my staff that have worked very hard in the invitation and the work that has gone through in pre uh, preparation for this. So I want to thank everyone for your contributions. I want to welcome all of you on behalf of our chancellor uh, to the event today. And I want to thank uh, David for his contributions. At this point, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Kim Wynn that most of you know, but just in case, and I have to read here because there are a number of contributions that she's making, is that she's co-principal investigator of the pilot regional Lewis Stokes Center, Midwest Center for Excellence, the foundation, founding director for operations of the Urban Center for the Advancement of STEM Education, we call UK's in the IU School of Education, and here's Dr. We, and he is, no, is not, yes. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to Professor David L. Stockham. To my knowledge, there's no David Stockham in this lecture. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for the correction. Go ahead, Kim. Kim, wait. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Nguyen. I have been recently in the last seven years at the Center for Advancement of STEM Education. UK is a center that's funded by the joint effort of the School of Science and the School of Education. My responsibility in the center is to facilitate the training expands the opportunity for individuals to become math and science teachers. In whatever role I have had at IUPUI for the last 28 years, I had always been a strong promoter for diversity. And I accredit many of my accomplishments to the support and encouragement of the speaker of today. Dr. David L. Stokem. I had the privilege of working and personally known David Stokem for the last 22 years. He was kind enough to ask if I make the introduction at this lecture. 
I came to the School of Science as just the first appointed professional staff who had a job that David dreamed of. He gave me a job called coordinator for academic and student services. At that time, it was unheard of. Because of his encouragement, because of the commitment to facilitate growth and success of students, I was able to support him, advance myself to be assistant dean for enrollment management in the School of Science. The last 15 years working in the School of Science under David Stokem leadership, I have to admit it is the hallmark of my career. And the person who make it and help me to accomplish that far is again the speaker of today, Dr. David Stokem. David has faith in my work, he trusts my judgment, and he allowed me to explore the impossible. And I have him as a mentor, and I congratulate him for being the outstanding boss I have had for 15 years. Dr. Matthew Palakow, he is now the Executive Associate Dean in the School of Informatics and Computing, had told me that he, Dr. Palakow was a former chair of the Department of Computer Science. He described Dr. Stokem as a man with a vision, and the school had distinguished and flourished itself during his time. <clears throat> David Stokem, in his personal reflection about the year he served as dean in the School of Science, has said, my leadership management style is based on the assumption that the maximum result I achieve by surrounding myself with the best of such colleagues, delegate responsibility and authority to them, but let them do what they know how to do it within the context of shared mission and shared vision for the organization. The School of Science has indeed flourished during the 15 years of David Stokem serving as dean from 1989 through 2004. And I would credit the growth of the school into the leadership style and the philosophy as a vision of David Stokem. Please allow me to recount the impact that David had made in the School of Science and what I think as a as a contributing to the leadership of David Stoker. First, he built a strong, diverse faculty and staff, and because of that, we attract diverse, strong, excellent student body. He developed nationally known, recognized program, and therefore, he focused more on the student success he support department chair to expand, develop, and initiate program in research and graduate education that make us one of the unique research institution at IUPUI. He built a strong connection with the community and bring visibility to the School of Science. And most of all, he understood RCM so well that he was able to facilitate growth, flex flexibility, and develop more quality and quantity of research and, and program at IUPUI. David is a model academician. Academician is a name that Dr. Dr. Palakau helped call. He called David a model academician because he is able to excel in teaching, research, and was able to become an outstanding dean all at the same time. Additionally, David Stokem is a mentor. 
He mentored graduate students and postdoc fellows. Dr. Feng Yu Song, a faculty member in the School <coughs> of Dentistry, wrote the following. I have known David since 2006, first as his first doc fellow, and later as a college, junior college on campus. In the last eight years, David not only nourished my growth in research in tissue regeneration, but nurtured my, my style growing as an academic scholar and a person. She also said, he is the one who constantly encouraged his mentee, and I am one of those, to embrace and challenge and chart the new journey for their career path. He's the one foresee the future of research and education. Therefore, actively seeking, initiating multidisciplinary <coughs> collaboration. He developed program across department. He worked across department, across campus, and even across countries. David Stokem also <coughs> cultivate talents. Within the last eight years, three of his postdocs had taken faculty position in the US and more than 10 have been accepted in graduate and medical and dental school. David Stokem, Dr. Sung wrote, is a true scholar. David Stokem is indeed a scholar whose research and publication <coughs> have revolutionized the field of regenerative biology and medicine. His book has become standard textbook and he not only known for writing textbook, he known for provocative, interesting talk, such as many years ago you have uh, he had given a talk about the legacy of Frankenstein, <laughs> regenerative biology and medicine. He also talked about urban universities as a model for 21st century. Actually, his thought had been fruition into a publication that published in 2010 by the Metropolitan University Journal under the title, The, Urban, the, the Evolution of 21st Century Public Higher Education, The Urban University as Prototype. These publications and conference presentation had clearly, clearly indicated that he had great deal of concern and he thought a great deal about undergraduate education in the U.S. This afternoon, David L. Stokem will, sell, will share with you one of the things, unusually, but often, keep him awake at night throughout his amazing career as a teacher, a mentor, a scholar, and most of all, a visionary dean. I present you Dr. David L. Stockham, the speaker of the last lecture, 2014, sponsored the event sponsored by IUPUI Senior Academy, IUPUI Administration and the IU Foundation. The title of his last lecture is Regenerating the Values of Public Higher Education Thought of an Unreconstructed Dean. Would you please join me to welcome Dr. Stoker. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I wish to thank the Senior Academy for the honor of representing them in the delivery of this year's last lecture. I don't want to bore you, but I thought it best to begin by telling you something of myself that may be useful in understanding my views on the thoughts that I want to share with you uh, today. My friends and colleagues of long standing know me to be basically skeptical and irreverent. 
sometimes with unintended consequences. Others have sometimes mistaken these traits for cynicism, but I do not consider myself to be a cynic. True, I have no proclivity to call a lemon anything but a lemon. And anyway, the medics tell us that the sugar required to make a lemon into lemonade can have long-term effects on your health. I have been described as passionate about things I care about, and this is certainly true. It is also true that I'm anti-authoritarian, but I'm also pro-authority. One of the things I learned early in life is that authority and authoritarian is not the same thing. Authority is earned by personal characteristics that include vision, competence, character, compassion, and fairness. People react positively to those traits. <coughs> Authoritarians use position and rank to demand obedience to which individuals react negatively. I have always found authoritarianism distasteful and a mark of weakness masquerading as strength. I grew up as the oldest of four children in the small central Pennsylvania town of Jersey Shore on the west branch of the River Susquehanna. My youthful ambition was to be a jet pilot in the Air Force. I thought one could apply for pilot training right out of high school, but I soon found out you needed at least two years of college in order to be considered. My German teacher, Joyce Gilbert, thought I might like her alma mater, which was 60 miles down river in Sealands Grove. So I applied and was admitted to Susquehanna University in the fall of 1957 as a first generation student. College was an intellectual awakening for me, and I became a passionate believer in the power of higher education to generate skills and thought patterns that were important to one's personal development. To this day, I remember the names and faces of in inspirational professors. Bruce Hansen in biology, Phil Bossert in psychology, Fred Gross in physics, William Russ in history, David McKenzie in English literature, Russell Gilbert in German, and Benjamin Lotz in religious studies. I graduated in 1961 with a double major in biology and psychology. And I also took the Air Force examinations for pilot training in my senior year and was selected. But I was in the first stages of nearsightedness which would disqualify me as a pilot. And moreover, my interests had changed, so I declined and went to graduate school in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where in 1963, I earned a Master of Science in Zoology under Professor Ray Watterson, who introduced me to the subject that would become my life's work, regeneration. My first academic job was a one-year appointment at Iowa Wesleyan College in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, where I found that I enjoyed and was possibly even good at teaching. And there, I had the good fortune to interact with some very talented students. One of these students who has become a lifelong friend was William H. McLean, who is here this afternoon. He's sitting right here. He's the guy who mispronounces my name. <laughs> You'll get a later, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Bill is a Purdue PhD, we'll forgive him for that, and is Halverson Professor Emeritus of Molecular Biology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he has earned distinction for deciphering, among other things, the steps in the synthesis of molecules called transfer RNAs, which work in the assembly of proteins uh, by the cell. Enough distinction, I might add, to be in that elite group of people who are considered for the Nobel Prize. In the spring of 1964, I was admitted to the graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And four years later, I earned a PhD in cell and developmental biology. I'll always cherish those days at Penn as one of the most exciting intellectual times in my life, thanks to my lab mates and our beloved mentor, Dr. Charles E. Wilde, Jr. Then in the fall of 1968, I began a 20-year teaching, research, and administrative career at the University of Illinois. I taught courses in cell and developmental biology and evolution, directed the honors biology program, was acting head of the Department of Anatomy in the School of Medical Sciences, and pursued a successful NSF and NIH-funded research program on regeneration. 
One of my best colleagues at Illinois was Dr. Joanne Cameron, and she is here today as well, Joanne. In 1989, I accepted the position of Dean of the School of Science at IUPUI, a position that I held for 15 years. I will always be proud of what our faculty, staff, and administration accomplished during those years. We developed research programs that synergized with our undergraduate academic programs. Our research programs were small, based, but, but they were based on great ideas that eventually resulted in getting the requisite funding to pursue those ideas. Yesterday, I was privileged to take a trip down memory lane with one of our most stellar uh, faculty, Professor Nagaswara Rao, who reviewed the history of his research on characterizing enzymes that use ATP, the energy storing molecule that powers uh, our cells. That was a great group of people. They were the founding individuals who started the rise of the School of Science uh, in research. At the time, math was a big obstacle to a lot of our beginning students, so we set up a math assistance center that has been highly successful. And then embracing the idea of several of our African-American students, we established what is now called the Diversity Research Scholars Program. Other efforts established a forensic science program, an external development office, and community <coughs> connections. Most of all, we hired faculty better than ourselves. Our school is led today by one of those faculty members, Dean Simon Rhodes. I was very impressed with what Dr. Paydar said about IUPUI, and I agree with everything that he said. But I am an unreconstructed dean, and there's a dark side to all of this, and that is really what I'm going to tell you about uh, today. As exciting as it was to have the opportunity to build a strong academic unit, it, seemed, it soon became clear to me that IUPUI was not highly regarded, largely due to its lack of identity and autonomy, and that its parent institutions wanted to keep it that way. <laughs> state funding per student was the lowest of all universities in the state of Indiana. I don't know if that's changed. I hope it has. Through my own experiences as dean and a broader comparison of state institutions nationally, I gradually came to the conclusion that American public higher education is a caste system, dominated in each state by one or two massive flagship universities, characterized by a culture of snobbish exclusivity and entitlement that compete in a frantic arms race for money and research prestige rankings. The flagships treat their subordinate campuses and other state-supported universities with patronizing condescension, if not outright contempt. The caste system is disguised under the euphemism of mission differentiation, the assignment of different academic missions based on presumptions of intellectual quality of students and faculty and the apportioning of resources according to those presumptions. The science fiction writer, Dean Kuntz, succinctly summarized all this in one line in his book, Brother Odd. He says, most universities are no longer temples of knowledge, but of power, and true moderns worship there. This system, in my view, is ugly and dysfunctional. To understand its origin, we need to examine a paradigm shift it was driven by an influx of federal and state money into the largest of the state universities after World War II. These were primarily land-grant universities created by the Morrill Acts of 1862 and 1890 with the visionary purpose of making higher education available to persons of all social classes. For a long time, there was a strong value system in these universities that put students first. Throughout the first decade after World War II, they were especially effective in educating millions of returning military men under the GI Bill. One of America's great cell biologists at Indiana University Bloomington, Professor Tracy Sonneborn, reflected these values when in response to a question on teaching versus research, he said that first he gave his 40 hours to the university, then his 40 hours to research. 
Sonneborn's meaning was clear. The core function of the university is undergraduate education. Research is also a core function, but is not more important than undergraduate education. There is no question that in their original form, the large state universities made significant contributions to the agricultural, scientific, technological, and civic and cultural strength of the nation, to the upward mobility of its citizens, and to the building of a more equitable and opportunity-filled society. This tradition of providing upward mobility and opportunity began to unravel in the 1960s, as the largest state universities were defined as flagships and research money and publications became the currency of success. By the 1980s, the flagships had become addicted to research prestige rankings. This prestige has become an end in itself where rank, size, money, and power are used for self-aggrandizement and to deny aspirations and respect to, quote, inferior state universities. The flagship academic culture that has developed around research prestige can be toxic and bring out the worst in people. Too many flagship faculty, administrators, and trustees come off as arrogant, narcissistic snobs, lacking in conscience and integrity. At Illinois, I saw how faculty and administrators looked down on the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I experienced the flagship arrogance and snobbery directly as a dean at IUPUI, as did other uh, deans. I'm not alone in this. 35 years ago, a colleague at Illinois shared with me a letter he had received from a highly acclaimed colleague who described the culture of the public flagship he had just left as follows. And I quote, minimal goodwill, intern protectiveness of self, intense competitiveness, glee in the belittlement of others, insecure self-esteem, the plotting progress through life with little of its joy, the loss of ideals, of integrity, of concern for others, of the beauty of life, and sharing it with others. This man died recently at age 100 with over 1,600 publications in his field. He has, I think, given an accurate description of the beast. The focus on prestige rankings and the educational and social costs they exact has been extensively documented over the past five decades, though largely ignored. Recently, renewed criticism of public higher education has taken center stage. The criticism is aimed at the rising cost and declining quality of a college education. Rising tuition is the result of many factors, but a major target is administrative bloat the increasing specialization and proliferation of high-salaried administrative positions. The declining, declining quality of undergraduate education is also due to multiple factors. A major one, in my view, is the flagship addiction to research prestige. So how does this addiction contribute to the decline in educational quality? First, grants and publications have become the primary basis for professorial advancement and reward. Professors must teach less to free up the time to continually write multiple grant proposals. Flagships now have two faculties, one a highly paid research faculty, the other a lower paid teaching faculty. Competition for grant money has increased to the point of absurdity and will get even worse because of unsustainable federal research budgets and overproduction of PhDs that increases the pool of competitors. Amidst this competition, medical schools are pressing research faculty to fund a substantial portion of their base salary from grants. So I ask the question, might this be coming soon to schools of liberal arts, science, engineering, law, and business as well? Second, the research prestige game requires large sums of money for research and graduate program administration. Indirect cost recovery money, that is money for administrative and facilities expenses of grants does not completely cover these expenses and tuition and fee, tuition and state appropriation dollars must be injected. This is one reason why out-of-state enrollment in flagship universities is as high or higher than 35% and growing because these students pay three times what an in-state student pays. Data suggest that this disparity is creating two economic tiers of students 
an upper class that can afford the triple tuition, and a lower class that struggles to pay the in-state rate. This disparity is reflected in a widening resource inequality between flagships and other state institutions. At the same time, the so-called lower tier universities are expected to educate the majority of the state's students with fewer resources. They are discouraged from doing research, yet the research prestige by which flagships measure each other has become the default state by which every state university is measured. So there's a ripple effect here where the non-flagships feel compelled to add or expand research programs in order to gain some measure of respect. This quest for respect is then derisively called mission creep. The worst, the worst effect of the addiction to research prestige has been the devaluation of undergraduate education to the point where the prestige of individual faculty members is inversely proportional to the amount of undergraduate teaching they do. I have always viewed teaching, research, and administration as synergistic with a need to be balanced with respect to one another. Most flagship administrators and faculty do not. Their number one priority is research. In my first year at Illinois, a senior colleague took me aside to explain the unwritten rules for promotion and tenure. Your time needs to be spent getting grants and publications, he said, so spend as little time with the undergraduates as possible. Another colleague, when asked to teach an undergraduate course, responded that he didn't come here to teach undergraduates, but to do research. In a 1989 publication titled Values Added, Undergraduate Education at the Universities of the CIC, the Committee on Institutional Cooperation, which consists of all the Big Ten universities plus the University of Chicago, professed that in addition to the evaluation of research and tenure and promotion decisions, we also require, and I quote here, we also require clear evidence of teaching ability and both are valued and rewarded. During my career at Illinois, I never saw any evidence that teaching ability or success was valued or rewarded, at least in my discipline of the biological sciences. The only thing that counted for tenure and promotion was externally funded research and publications. The fact that five ships reward only research while marketing and selling undergraduate education is clearly a contradiction in values. The fact that this contradiction, contradiction can be maintained is explained by the fact that prospective students and parents naively think that athletic and research prestige equates to quality undergraduate education. This perception is one of the great myths of public higher education. Murray Sperber played Mythbuster in his book titled Beer and Circus, which was written around 2000 where he argued persuasively that flagships pander to students with alcohol-associated sports entertainment as a proxy for quality undergraduate education. The evidence suggests that research prestige is a similar proxy. Far too many students choose to attend universities based <coughs> on a halo effect of social, athletic, and research prestige, not knowing or caring whether or not they actually get a quality education. The American Association of Universities plays a major role in the arms race for research prestige. The purpose of the AAU is to promote strong programs in academic research and scholarship and graduate and professional education and to lobby in Washington to fund member research. Membership in the AAU is by invitation only based on four criteria, federal research funding per faculty member, the percentage of faculty who are members of the National Academies, faculty awards, and citations. Approximately 34 public universities and 25 private ones are members. AAU membership is a powerful opiate in the addiction to research prestige. Reminds me of Breaking Bad. <laughs> Current members and wannabes will do anything in their power to maintain or acquire membership. The AAU weeds unworthy members from its ranks. All of the Big Ten universities are members of the AAU except Nebraska, which was expelled in 2012 after falling below the research dollar threshold. 
The problem was that the University of Nebraska did the right thing and gave credit where credit was due by reporting the research dollars of its medical center in Omaha separately from those of the Lincoln campus. So now we should ask the question, shouldn't we kick Nebraska out of the Big Ten Conference for their poor performance? As you might suspect, uh, a disease of human nature underlies the pathological prestige seeking of public flagships. During my college summers, uh, I worked in two Baltimore-based YMCA camps. They were located in the tobacco country on the western shore of southern Maryland. The camps were segregated. I spent one summer at Camp Kanoi uh, for white kids on the lower Chesapeake Bay, and my final two summers at Camp Mohawk for brown kids on the Patuxent River. We, were all, we all very much admired and respected the director of Camp Mohawk, Mr. Al Moss. It was 1960, and the camp had, brought, um, had bought a motorboat at Solomon's Island, where the Patuxent empties in Chesapeake. Two white friends from Kanoi and I, along with Mr. Moss, took the boat up the Patuxent toward Mohawk. Around noon, we stopped at a resort area to get lunch, but as we were scrambling out of the boat, Mr. Moss said matter-of-factly, sorry, fellas, but I can't go in there. And for a moment, we were confused, but then remembered that these places were segregated. So we got takeout and continued on. Mr. Moss did not seem outwardly bothered by this incident. He had probably experienced it multiple times, but my friends and I were furious that he was refused service simply because of his skin color. This was my first encounter with overt racism, and it was a moment that forever defined my attitudes toward civil rights and liberties. Many years later, I read Robert Fuller's book titled Somebodies and Nobodies, and realized that this incident, as well as much of what I had experienced as a dean at IUPUI, fell under the umbrella of what Fuller called rankism, defined as the use of rank and power to demean the value, dignity, and accomplishments of individuals or groups. He made a powerful case that isms such as racism, elitism, sexism, and authoritarianism are all manifestations of rankism. Individuals and institutions use rankism to strip the ranks below them of dignity and self-worth, in order to feed their own sense of self-importance. The more me, the less you. I see rankism in the form of elitism and authoritarianism as the disease that afflicts our public flagship universities. Let me be absolutely clear here. There's nothing wrong with striving to be elite, meaning to be the best you can be. Nor is there anything wrong with authority and rank earned on the basis of performance. Elitism, on the other hand, means the belief in and practice of rule by an elite. Coupled with authoritarianism, such rule brooks no dissent, aspiration, or evolution. In the academic world, it translates into active or subtle demeaning by flagships of institutions with lower research prestige, and it erodes the purpose and value of higher education. I would now like to turn to how we might regenerate a value system in public higher education that is based not on rankism, but on a core mission of excellence in undergraduate education, synergized with research excellence. To do this, we must first ask the question of what is the primary purpose of higher education, which today appears to be progressively more consumerist and vocational. In the 1920s, Charles Grosvenor Osgood the Holmes Professor of Bell's Letters at Princeton University answered this question succinctly, and I quote, the supreme end of education is expert discernment in all things. The power to tell the good from the bad, the genuine from the counterfeit, and to prefer the good and the genuine to the bad and the counterfeit. We pursue this end through learning, by study, through experience, by discovery, and most importantly of all, from mistakes and failures. Learning is arguably the most important process we engage in throughout our lives, says Joseph Martin in his book, To Rise Above Principle. And the commitment to learning is a very strong statement of values held 
and advocated. Learning instills honesty and offers ample opportunity to acquire a decent humility that enables one to acknowledge their own limitations. It advocates education rather than indoctrination, and it manifests the faith that free and well-educated people will not succumb to authoritarian or totalitarian dogma. Within this context, I would like to share with you some values that I believe must be regenerated within our academic culture. In general, be honest and try to do the right thing. I recommend the rotary four-way test to determine if an action or view is the right thing. One, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Be the best you can be, but also remember that life isn't an unbroken string of successes. In fact, you learn more from the inevitable failures. On teaching, set high standards and honor achievement under, under those standards. Creative teaching depends on a passion for and understanding of subject matter, but also organizational skills and an attitude that treats students as an investment in the future. Here I think of the great Caltech physicist, Richard Feynman, who taught freshman physics so successfully and inspirationally that his course was published as the three-volume Feynman Lectures. Said a colleague, speaking of Feynman's inimitable style, here's the deal. If you want to do this physics thing, vanilla style, go by and read a nice physics textbook. If you want to taste physics, really take it in like a delicious chocolate mousse, a symphony orchestra, or Shakespeare done by British folk, this is where you have to be. Bottom line, those who can, teach. <laughs> On research, research is fundamental to the health and wealth of society. But funding for research should be open and should be awarded to those with the best ideas. Never favored or suppressed based on some half-baked notion of mission differentiation or research prestige. Work on interesting problems, whether or not they have immediate application. Adhere to a high standard of science and research ethics. Question everything you think. Here I think of the superb comparative paleogeneticist Savante Pabo. In his wonderful book on Neanderthal genomes, he describes the extensive precautions and controls he had to run in order to distinguish genuine Neanderthal DNA from contaminating modern human DNA, which is everywhere. Pabo's research includes another message, do not cut corners. Too many scientists are in a rush to be first or to make a big splash, and they make big mistakes. Or worse, they commit fraud. Administrators. I love administrator jokes, <laughs> which there are probably thousands, mainly made up by faculty, right? So, such as these. There are administrators who can sometimes be counted on to do the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> or, then there was the dean who bragged that his faculty would follow him anywhere to which a faculty member muttered, yeah, but only out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> Jokes aside, administrators need to be cognizant of what is on the cutting edge and have a vision for the future that takes advantage of current and buildable strengths. Always hire people better than yourself. The goal should be increased quality, not prestige. Don't make the biggest mistake many administrators make surrounding oneself with yes people and then being a micromanager. You have to be willing to challenge the status quo when necessary. And other de desirable characteristics are humility, empathy, willing to listen, inclusiveness, ability to delegate, collegiality, and trustworthiness. In short, the perfect person and non-existent person. <laughs> Remember that leadership is everywhere. Use it. And finally, administrators often have to deal with people who may have good hearts but difficult personalities. I've gotten good advice on this from the Godfather films. 
don't get angry with people, just reason with them. It's not personal, it's just business. <laughs> Regenerating our academic value system will require substantial changes in the structure of public higher education. I find the original land grant vision of Justin Morrill as, pow as pers powerfully <coughs> persuasive as ever, but that vision was not based on the idea of creating an educational caste system. The flagships want to maintain this, the status quo while gaming, gaining more money, prestige, and power. Some are now claiming that their system-associated campuses damage their ability to maintain their prestige. They want to separate from their systems and accept slightly lower state funding in exchange for fewer strings on how they use state dollars. Simultaneously, select flagships would like to have the federal government subsidize their research and graduate education, augmented by corporate and private gifts. The federal subsidy required has been estimated as between 22 and $30 billion per year, in addition to the current NIH and NSF research budgets. Lots of luck. Non-flagships would focus their resources only on undergraduate education supported by student tuition and private gifts. One change in the status quo would be to spin off the research function into institutes that have no university affiliation and are financed solely by grants and philanthropy. Many such institutes already exist primarily on the East and West Coasts and are highly successful. All the state universities could now focus on undergraduate education. They would all receive a certain state appropriation and charge the same tuition. The formation of research institutes would reduce university rankism based on research prestige because reputation would now have to be earned solely on the basis of how well the institutions performed in delivering undergraduate education. On the other hand, an argument can be made that research and graduate education and undergraduate education belong together under the same roof but need to be more integrated and synergistic. This is what I would favor but without the caste system. A research mission should be open to any university that chooses it. The nature of that mission would be the choice of the individual university. But this mission would not be allowed to take precedence over the educational mission. Each state university would receive the same legislative appropriations and charge the same tuition, and furthermore, teaching would be rewarded on a par with research. This structure would be beneficial on several levels. First, harnessing a multi-level workforce to meet the state's economic needs, solving the problem of student retention and graduation rates, applying the full economic and cultural power of faculty <coughs> research talent and expertise over a much broader area of the state, and making it much easier to join with the K-12 system in setting standards of student preparation for university work and teacher training, and finally, informing, informing collaborations to address educational issues. In short, this structure would recommit to the original vision of Justin Morrill, but addressing modern needs, problems, and responsibilities using modern technological tools and concepts. State universities would not be operating in isolation from one another as they are now, but rather in networks enabled by inter-institutional collaboration, thus maximizing the investments made in the higher education system. To keep research and undergraduate education together under this scenario would require a huge change in the mission differentiation culture of public higher education. The flagships would need to give up their rankism and their arms race for research, research prestige, though not the goals of research excellence, and be willing to collaborate with other institutions in their states and beyond. So how realistic is this scenario? Not very. Realistically, the effort needed to overcome the inertia of the status quo would be tremendous, and there would be fierce resistance from the flagships, from their alumni and students, whose identities are wrapped up in their school's symbols and rankings, and from the politicians who perpetuate the status quo. Flagship ability to adapt is low because of their focus on brand and research prestige. Therefore, I want to conclude by suggesting that there may be an evolutionary solution to the problem, whereby a new species of university, better adapted to the needs of the 21st century, 
will arise by natural selection. This species is the urban university. The selective pressures will be changing demographics, a global information-based e economy, a shift to technology-oriented manufacturing, the need for a much higher quality of education, and most importantly, the need for cities as cultural centers and centers of economic development to have strong, multi-purpose public universities that are engaged with the real world. Donald Langenberg, former chancellor of the University of Maryland, said in his keynote speech celebrating the 20th anniversary of the founding of IUPUI, and I quote, the urban university is bringing to the cities the populist land grant spirit that propelled our older state universities to greatness. It is upon these urban universities that the future of our cities and hence our nation depends. A number of such universities across the country that are in charge of their own destiny are evolving as leaders in integrating teaching, research, and service into a balanced whole that serves their state national and global constituents with the maximum in impact. IUPUI could be one of those universities if, if we get, get the autonomy that is needed to do so. A prime example that I can offer is the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, led by its president, Freeman Habrowski III, who will be at the Madam Walker Theater on April the 8th to speak on creating a culture of academic excellence. UMBC has a highly diverse student body and is known for its academic excellence and research in the sciences, engineering, and the liberal arts. In evolutionary terms, I liken universities like UMBC to the small mammals of 600 million years ago. They are diversifying in the undergrowth, waiting to see how the dinosaurs fare. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. athletics is uh, and uh, the race for research prestige are one and the same. There is no difference between them. I can remember colleagues complaining about athletics of Illinois, how they, you know, these teams and the behavior of the uh, participants in sports programs, particularly football and basketball, uh, was sullying our uh, academic reputation. But they are no different than, than we are in this quest for research prestige. So um, if you just examine it uh, a little bit, you find that there are all of these similarities. Who do we cater to in our flagship universities? It's the professors who bring in the research grants okay, and publish the papers. They are the stars, and so they get deferential treatment. In football and basketball, the stars get deferential treatment. Now, the only difference is, is that the sports people uh, have ways of gaming the system to bring in people who can barely read or write. Okay? You, that won't work in the academic sector. So um, then we have criminal activities. Uh, 
We all, we all know about the criminal activities in the sports world because they get good <coughs> press. For example, the Sandusky uh, thing at uh, Penn State University. But there are lots of criminal activities that go on in academics, too. Data falsification, publication of, of papers where things are not right. We have a big controversy like that going on right now with these so-called uh, STAP cells, this very interesting and simple method of producing pluripotent cells. And it looked just wonderful, except somebody looked a little too closely at the uh, data in those, uh, uh, those papers and found out that there were some major discrepancies. And now um, we seem to be on the verge of those papers being retracted. They were published in a premier journal, Nature. So, um, you know, the, so in my mind, um, the sports programs and the research programs that are, and the, the, the seeking research prestige seeking athletic prestige, are one and the same. They're all bound up, by the way, in the brand of the university, that wonderful word, brand, like we're cattle, you know. Um, it's, it, it seems insane to me. Thank you very much. Yeah. My question has two parts. One is, you refer to the East and West Coast as having spun off and created some research institutes. Um, as a possible future option for all of us. And uh, I wondered what your perspective is on being able to retain faculty whose real strengths are in the area of research if we lose them from the university to the private institutes. And the other part is, I wasn't sure where you uh, would include um, the most elite higher education institutions since they are generally private. Um, and so where do they fall in your view in terms of the competition with the public, uh, public institutions? Right. Um, the private institutions uh, I would leave alone. They charge what the traffic can bear and they have terrifically big endowments. Um, and they're not like the public institutions which take state money. Okay? And that's why, by the way, uh, a number of the public flagships want to separate themselves from all the other state institutions. They want to be like the private universities, have total control over the use of their, their money. Now, when that happens, you know that the tuition is going to skyrocket to the level that we see in the private institutions. And okay, that's, that's fine if uh, the states are willing to say, yeah, we're letting you go and uh, pay us a dollar for the um, real estate and the buildings and you're on your own. Well, that will leave places like us in the driver's seat, really, for undergraduate education. So, okay. Um, so I'm going to leave the private institutions alone. If we're going to get this kind of uh, uh, privatization of public institutions, then that is something that we will learn how to take advantage of, I think. And what was your, the first part of your question again? Uh, losing uh, a prospective faculty whose uh, real strength is in research and uh, losing them entirely from this university. Environment. Yeah, well, we haven't lost them. They'll be in institutes and they'll be producing, in fact, um, they'll be able to focus better than ever on uh, research. And that's fine, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it sort of implies, though, that what's left behind, the people who are teaching the undergraduates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are sort of second class. And I think we need to get rid of that kind of attitude. These are people who are not second class. Many of them are very, very good uh, in the classroom. Many are very innovative in teaching strategies as um, well as other um, parameters of, of, of teaching. And so I don't see any loss in that at all. And by the way, I want to connect that with the sports question. 
James Duderstadt, who was the former uh, president of the University of Michigan, wrote a wonderful book about the problems with Division I athletics. And he actually recommended that the football and basketball uh, programs of these Division I universities be spun off to become part of, uh, become farm teams for the NBA and the NFL. So um, that's not an, an, a new idea at all, and it might work. One last question. OK. David, within all of this, um, how do the different kinds of faculty fit? I'm thinking of tenure track, uh, a whole array of adjuncts in the health sciences, clinical faculty. You have within faculty, in, in its own way, sort of a caste system. Yes. Yes. Indeed, it is a caste system. Now, I want to make a, 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 a difference in what we do here at IUPUI than just from the, the general problem that adjuncts have. We have lots of part-time instructors, adjunct instructors. They come from the business world. They come from the corporate world. And they have been made uh, you know, marvelous contributions to our programs. They have day jobs, but then they do this other thing for us uh, on the side. And they bring insights and experiences that we otherwise would not have from our tenure track faculty members. But at a lot of universities now, even the flagships, I think I'm remembering the figure correctly that 47% of the faculty in flagship universities are poorly paid adjuncts with no health benefits. And sometimes these are people who go from one university to the other teaching a course for $2,500 in order to try to cobble together a salary of $25,000 to $30,000 a year. That's terrible um, to, to exploit people like that, but that is what a lot of universities do. They're very <coughs> exploitative. So um, I don't know what the answer to this is, but I think I do know that there is a connection between this exploitation and the seeking research prestige. Because this is where the faculty, the tenure track faculty, say, I, don't, I can't teach. I need the time to write multiple grant proposals. So that, the, the loss of them from the classroom means they have to be filled in by somebody else. And that is usually one of these poorly paid adjunct professors. So yes, that, this, that caste system is, uh, caste system within a caste system is, you know, it's just, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it, it, it can be acceptable for much longer. Thank you, folks. Uh, Thank you all. Um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Dr. Stock, is it? Oh, Longo. Longo Stokum, right? Not, Not his. Cool. Right. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure. Dr. Stokum's reflections today have truly captured the spirit and the essence of the last, uh, last lecture series. His presentation, Regenerating the Values of Public Higher Education, Thoughts of an Unreconstructed Dean sparks the imagination and provides a provocative perspective for all of us. Dr. Stokum, your scholarship, experience, and service to the campus <clears throat> is truly inspirational. The IU Foundation has been pleased to support the last lecture series for the past six years. The last lecture has provided each of our guest lecturers the opportunity to share their unique perspective with us and in so doing, has served to influence the larger community dialogue and affect On behalf of the campus and the Indiana University Foundation, we are honored to support your presentation of the lecture today and to recognize this most prestigious occasion 
with this honorarium. So let me also share that Dr. Stokem has decided to very generously contribute his honorarium to the Senior Academy. Thank you. At this time, I'll ask Walt Lenny to join Dr. Stokem on the stage to present the Senior Academy Award. Thank you very much, Dean. Dean, at this time, I guess we no longer have a mic. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. We have a plaque to present to you for your wonderful contribution to the university. And uh, thank you very much for Stop. donating the honorarium back to the Senior Academy. It'll be put to good use. Great. All thank right. you very much. Thank you. Adjourn, uh, there's a few people I need to recognize to thank them for what they have done. First of all, we do have two special guests here Dean Angela McBride, a former presenter of the last lecture. Dean McBride. And Dean Bob Einhart, the first last lecture. If two. As you all know, it takes a host of people to put this all on, and I want to thank the people from the Office of the Academic Affairs, Steve, uh, Sue Harrell, Susan Christian, Angie Vincy Bohr, Lori Kusterman, and Christine Fitzpatrick. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank the IUPY Senior Academy Selection uh, Committee that came up with our presenter today, and that is Rosalie Vermette, Amy Conrad Warner, Catherine Wilson, Sherry Gladden, and Larry Goldblatt. And of course, the Dean of the committee, Golan Manan. Give him a big hand too. And finally, uh, special thanks to the campus center staff, Michael Sprinkle and Briar Fretter and also to Aaron Miller, who provided tech support in the theater today. We'd also like to recognize student Andrew Townsend, who is videotaping today's program, our photographer Liz Kay from IU Communications, and Jane Wiseman Lane with the IUPY Event Services, who plans today's receptions. This concludes the last lecture program. I'd like to again to thank Dr. Stoughton for a wonderful last lecture. Please join us out in the foyer for a reception outside and to continue our conversation with Dr. Scott. Thank you again very much.